The Sumatran rhino holds several rhino superlatives. It's the smallest, the hairiest, the most vocal, the closest living relative of the extinct woolly rhinoceros, and it's the most threatened of the five living rhino species. Its home is in the Sundalin hotspot, one of Earth's most biologically rich yet threatened terrestrial areas. Historically, it was found across Malaysia and Indonesia, and as far north on the mainland perhaps as China and Bangladesh. Today, however, wild Sumatran rhinos are restricted to the forests of Indonesia, mostly on the island of Sumatra, as well as also on Kalimantan, the Indonesian side of the island of Borneo. Now, it's a tough species to survey because they're mostly solitary animals, but population estimates, as you just saw, are less than 80 individuals, and the population is decreasing. In fact, experts now consider isolation to be the single biggest threat to the species. Animals aren't finding each other to mate, and so they're not making enough rhino babies, something that our uh, panelists will elaborate on in just a minute. So why convene a panel on the Sumatran rhino? Well, this species represents an incredible amount of evolutionary history, being the only living member of the most primitive group of rhinos that emerged 15 to 20 million years ago. Should this small, hairy, singing species blink out, it would be the first extinction of a full mammalian genus since the Tasmanian tiger disappeared in 1936. But there's a more optimistic reason for us to have our conversation today, and that is that in partnership with the Indonesian government, the conservation community has united in an unprecedented effort to bring this species back from the brink. Should the effort succeed, this heralds a new model of conservation moving forward. So to talk about that effort and all things Sumatran rhino, we have a great panel for you. I do want to say very sadly that the National Geographic fellow on this project, whose name is Rudy Putra, and who himself hails from the island of Sumatra, was unfortunately unable to join us at the very last minute. So Rudy will not be on the panel today, but we have four terrific folks who I'm going to introduce now. So Colby Bishop is the manager of programs, wildlife programs for the National Geographic Society. Corey Jaskowski is a conservationist and National Geographic Labs fellow. Kira Milam is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the IUCN Species Survival Commission. And Cece Sievert is the Deputy Director of the International Rhino Foundation. Please welcome our panelists. Welcome, guys. Uh, Cece, we're going to start with you on the end there, All right. because you and your organization, the International Rhino Foundation, IRF, for this conversation, have been working on Sumatran rhino conservation for decades. So introduce everyone here um, in the audience and online to the species. Sure. Thanks. Um, so the Sumatran rhino is a species on the brink of the extinction. Um, some even consider it the most endangered land mammal on Earth. Um, there are fewer than 80 individuals, as you said, and they are distributed across, um, mostly in Sumatra, across 10 small subpopulations. And some of these subpopulations are so tiny, they're as small as two or three individual animals. Uh, the Sumatran rhino um, uh, is, so it's isolated. And in addition to that, with a small number, the third problem is that the females have a reproductive pathology. So the longer the females go without breeding, um, the more likely they are to grow tumors or cysts in the reproductive tract. So the problem is, the longer they are isolated, the less likely they are to successfully breed if they do have the opportunity to um, come together and, and have a, a reproductive um, act. <laughs> 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 Well put, G-rated version. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so looking at this species, back in 2015, a group of scientists came together and they did what's called a population viability analysis. And they looked at all these factors, like the small population and genetic um, and demographic changes. And they realized that any population that's smaller than 15 animals um, will essentially just sort of die off in a quiet way, wither off into existence. And, um, and that is all based on zero poaching and zero human. <laughs> Little Sumatra that's okay. <laughs> So that's zero poaching and zero um, human mitigated threats. So uh, these tiny populations are highly at risk of just disappearing into nowhere. In the absence of other threats, 
just by the very nature of their isolation. Right, right. So if they aren't brought together, if they aren't breeding regularly in a larger population, then we're going to lose this whole species. And we're actually going to lose the whole genus because it's, a, it's not just a species, it's an entire genus. Yeah. Yeah, so Kira, given that, um, what Cece just laid out for us, what is the Sumatran rhino rescue effort? How was this conceived? Who's involved? And um, what is this effort trying to achieve? Sure. Um, so as Cece said, there's been decades of science and efforts to save Sumatran rhino, but they just really weren't as a species stepping back from that extinction cliff, despite many fantastic efforts. And so what we needed was one strategy, a one-plan approach that brought the governments and the NGOs and the global scientific community together to work as one team to save the Sumatran rhino. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, um, the world community of, science, of rhino experts worked with the Indonesian government officials to really come to an agreement that the only strategy at this point in time to save Sumatran rhinos was to find those isolated populations and relocate them into specifically built designed breeding facilities to really grow the population with the intention of once the population has grown, getting them back out there into the wild. And so last year, we came together um, in a project, a, a groundbreaking collaboration led by the Indonesian government. Unfortunately, there's no one here from the Indonesian government partnership um, representing today, but we would like to express our heartfelt thanks for the leadership in this initiative. But we brought together five founding organizations in the National Geographic, the IUCN Species Survival Commission, International Rhino Foundation, and also in the room today, um, World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and Global Wildlife Conservation. So these five conservation organizations came together with the Indonesian government to create an alliance that would work together with conservation organizations on the ground, so implementing partners with technical experts around the world, bringing together veterinary expertise, technology expertise, husbandry, communication and fundraising, to really work on one plan. And so from that, we've created the alliance. Each of those partners have put in a million dollars each, but towards a much larger fundraising goal with a commitment to work together to reach that goal and work with all of those partners to make sure that this effort is a success. And what is that? What's the timeline of that? So we're, we've got an ambitious three-year fundraising timeline, but obviously this project is much longer than that. The implementation plan at the moment spans five years, and we're one year in, so another four years. Um, but obviously we're working very closely with the Indonesian government on a rescue and breeding effort. So this sits within a wider Indonesian government initiative of a national breeding strategy for Sumatran rhino. So the intention is to bring those rhinos in, establish these facilities. So there are three objectives for the project. One is to build two new centres, one in Indonesian Borneo, one in northern Sumatra, and to expand the existing um, facility in Way Campus National Park in southern Sumatra. And then to find these rhinos, relocate them into these centres, and then establish a breeding program, working through the challenges that Cece just mentioned with their reproductive pathology, and then work with the Indonesian government and the communities and implementing partners to ensure that it can be carried into the long term for the survival of the species. Excellent. Great, thanks. So Colby, as your vantage, um, uh, from your vantage, I guess, as Director of Wildlife Programs, what role did you see for National Geographic here? What, um, what contributing value did Geographic want to add to this alliance? Yeah, definitely. So as Kira and Cece set up for us, over decades of research have, and science have gone into figuring out how, how the Sumatran rhino works. We know how to take care of it in a sanctuary. We know how Sumatran rhinos can mate and how to successfully breed them in a sanctuary. So National Geographic's unique role on this effort is to put the Sumatran rhino on the map. And we just had a fabulous panel talking about bringing these lesser known species, species that maybe people haven't heard about, live in faraway places, there's only 80 left. Our job is to take pictures like this. This is Joel Sartori's photo arc image of a Sumatran rhino. So people can look into the eyes of these species that maybe they've never seen before, see the hair on its back, and get, get to know it. We, um, we just had our storytelling team down at, one of, at the sanctuary in Way Campus in Indonesia. And they were there to film with the seven Sumatran rhinos that live there, but also to get to know and tell the stories of the keepers that work so closely with the Sumatran rhinos and the veterinarians that live on site with the rhinos to make sure that they're healthy. And then of the surrounding communities as well that have community gardens to help feed the rhinos. So our job really is to tell the 20 million years of evolutionary history that's at stake and gain public support and get everyone involved on this important effort. Ah, very cool, well said. 
Uh, Corey, you have an interesting resume. Um, you have 3D <laughs> scan of the Tomb of Christ. You've digitized uh, the mummified remains of a dinosaur in Canada. So what exactly, um, what exactly is the contribution of your role of technology, <laughs> your type of technology to this Sumatran rhino rescue effort? Good question. So I've been developing uh, technologies for exploration and scientific study with National Geographic for about 10 years. And while doing this, I realized that there's another critical use of these technologies. And that's to be able to show people some of these places we work in, in a different light, in a way using these technologies that they couldn't otherwise experience. And my team and I have built some pretty wild things. We've built uh, color night vision cameras to look up in the trees of jungles to see nesting chimpanzee families and see how they interact at night. We've built um, deep water systems that have been able to go miles back in caves and take underwater images, some of the highest resolution underwater images of the world um, of these incredible places. And even uh, equipment to work in really harsh environments like to take time lapses from everywhere from Mount Everest to Antarctica for the extreme ice program. But you know, following along with this mission, a couple years ago, we started doing 3D scanning, mostly of cultural and big natural places um, that are in danger in some fashion so that we could preserve and protect and share them. So we scanned, as you mentioned, the Tomb of Christ, um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was part of a big museum exhibit here at National Geographic. We've scanned the entire Nabataean city of Petra, Jordan, um, in submillimeter resolution. All of Chichen Itza, in interior of all the buildings, tombs that hadn't been accessed for 100 years, with my friend Guillermo Dianda, and natural places like the Okavango River Delta, about 1,000 square kilometers of that, and 1,000 square kilometers of Garamba in the National Park in DRC with my friend Naftali Honig, and they're using that at African parks for anti-poaching efforts. So with all these crazy big places that we've scanned, you might think that when National Geographic contacted me and said, hey, do you think you could 3D scan a living Sumatran rhino? That, <laughs> that maybe that would have sounded easy, but uh, it, it didn't. I almost, almost said no, actually. <laughs> so the challenge there is, is that when we're scanning these, these uh, cultural sites, like big rock temples, they're basically the same for years and years and years at a time. So our normal method of scanning is to bring six or eight people to a site and work at it for a month to do this big area 3D scan at submillimeter resolution. But the problem with living animals, of course, is that they move. Yeah. And so we basically have to do the same scan that we do in these big places, but do it in a millisecond. So you know that, that scared me quite a bit, but I knew that if we managed to pull this off, that we'd have something incredible. We'd have not just, um, we'd have an experience of the rhino that if we digitized the rhino, made a digital copy, and did video reference for all the motion analysis, we'd have something we could share with the world and give everybody an up-close look at the rhino and give them a way to be inspired and to share the rhino that they'll probably never be able to see uh, in the wild. We thought this could be so much more than a flat image. We thought this could um, actually, maybe we could even take the rhino and we could put it in the room with you. You could hear its footsteps. You could hear its vocalization and get the experience of it walking next to you. <laughs> so meet Harapan, the Sumatran rhino. happen? Well, um, so we traveled on site. My wife and I traveled to Sumatra, where we worked with the uh, Sumatran rhino rescue there um, to actually 3D scan the creature. So we, instead of doing we a single his name's Harapan. camera, Harapan, yep. Instead of using a single camera and lots of people, we used lots of cameras. <laughs> so we could set them all up outside of the enclosure that he voluntarily goes in every day, uh, lured by watermelon, um, to receive veterinary care. So these bars were nice and wide apart, so we could actually put our camera system outside of them, looking through the bars of the enclosure so the rhino wouldn't destroy our cameras, which was a big concern. And uh, you know, it rained hard every day, so we had this tarp over the top that was already part of the enclosure that we could keep the cameras dry. 
But we set up this array of 18 cameras in this case, all high resolution still cameras. And our idea was is that we could fire them all at the exact same time and capture a 3D scan in the same fashion that we would um, one at a time for a big archaeology site. So we set up this big array of cameras, um, pointed at the rhino, and got them all focused at where we would think the rhino would stand. And this is part of the hard part, right? Getting a, uh, a large rhino to stand exactly where he wanted to is not necessarily easy. But fortunately, he's very food motivated, and uh, he loves watermelon. <laughs> so, Aren't we all? <laughs> exactly. So we were able to get that done. And um, so Anne's in the enclosure there as we're doing focus tests. So she's standing exactly where we want the rhino to stand. And these all tether back to a group of boxes that synchronize the cameras to within a millisecond from each other so that we can fire the button at once and capture the rhino from every angle. And just like your two eyes give you stereo vision by the interocular distance of your eyes, we basically had 18 cameras. So we had 18 factorial, which is a really big number, of, uh, of eyeballs, eye pairs of eyes looking at the rhino, developing a 3D scan of him. And because we were doing it from one side, we'd take an image of him from one side and then have the watermelon move to the other side so we'd have him turn around. <laughs> and piece by piece, we built up this entire scan of the rhino. So you can see the uh, 3D model that we came out with here. And then you are, as you already saw, we can animate the rhino and bring him back to life. We built up a virtual Sumatran jungle to place him back in so that people could experience him in his environment. And when you're done here, if you go across to the cafeteria, we have a large 3D dome with glasses that you can experience the rhino in the Sumatran jungle. So it was a pleasure and an honor to work with this amazing animal. And uh, I hope that by helping you know, share him with the world, we can make more people care about him and continue to protect this amazing animal. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. It's, really, it's, it's amazing, and it was fabulous to see the front row um, try to <laughs> try to pet hairpin as he passed by. That's incredible, uh, Corey. Really, that is. Um, but Cece, this is not the first time that Hairpan has been in the States. Yes. First time in our auditorium here, certainly. But Hairpan has a history in the US. He does. Going back to the 1980s, right? Well, he, well, yeah, he was originally born here, but the whole history of captive Sumatran rhinos goes back to the 80s. Um, back in the 80s, um, scientists were realizing that this population was um, starting to plummet. The numbers were going down. And at that time, the estimated population was anywhere from 400 to 800 individuals. And so in 1984, a group of scientists came together in Singapore and decided that they would capture um, Sumatran rhinos and bring them into zoos around the world to create a um, insurance population, so to speak, so that if, God forbid, the wild population did disappear, we would have a backup population. So approximately, over 10 years, approximately 40 animals were captured, including Harapan's parents. And they were dispersed across zoos all around the world. And um, this was an incredible opportunity because Sumatran rhinos hadn't been in the care of zoos before. So it was an amazing opportunity to learn about both their husbandry and care as well as their nutrition. Because you, know, you think about what a white rhino eats, he's just a big lawnmower in South Africa. And then you think about the landscape that a Sumatran rhino lives in, there's no wide open um, fields of grass. They're eating twigs, they, they love their watermelon. Um, <laughs> very food motivated, but they eat hundreds of different species of plants. So this was an incredible opportunity to learn about this species. So um, unfortunately, uh, we were learning about a lot about the species, but babies were not being born. Um, by 1995, there were only three Sumatran rhinos left in the US. There was one over in LA, and then there were two in Cincinnati Zoo. And so the decision was made to bring them all together so that we could try and focus our last efforts on, on making rhino babies. Um, at that time, Dr. Terry Roth was hired at Cincinnati, and she had one, to, one main goal, which was to make babies, rhino babies. Um, <laughs> and, sorry, sorry, Terry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so she, um, they did um, assessments of the animals, and it turns out that one of the females wasn't reproductively viable. So that means they had one male, Ipu, and one female, Emmy. And so um, Terry put all of her efforts into trying to, trying to get a baby out of these to. And so for years, she was doing ultrasounds and trying to figure out what Emmy's cycle was so that they could, they could make this baby. And um, they just could, she was not ovulating. And so what they ended up doing was putting, like, 
putting them together and seeing what happens. And um, I don't know if any of you have seen Rhino's Mate. Um, it is not the most gentle act, I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> females often get quite injured in the process, but um, they really had no other choice. So um, they put the animals together and miraculously, they got along pretty well. And a few, um, soon thereafter, Emmy actually ovulated. And that's when Terry sort of cracked this whole nut on Sumatran Rhino breeding and it's the fact that they are induced ovulators. So most mammals, you know, humans for example, will cycle every 28 days, but Sumatran rhinos only cycle when there is an interaction between the males and females. And this is a huge discovery. So once they figured that out, they figured, all right, we're gonna start making rhino babies. And so meanwhile, around the same time, the International Rhino Foundation and our on the ground partner in Indonesia, the Rhino Foundation of uh, Indonesia, it's also known as Yabi, um, we established the first Sumatran rhino sanctuary in Wycombus National Park, and that's where Harapan currently lives. And so we had three animals there, but they weren't mating. And so we kept saying, come on, we gotta make some babies. So now that um, Terry had finally sort of cracked this nut on the induced ovulation, um, they actually got Emmy pregnant, but then she had a miscarriage. So then they got her pregnant again, and then another miscarriage, and she had five miscarriages. Oh and we were really losing hope. I mean, these were the last two animals we had to work with in, in captivity. So um, eventually Terry started Emmy on a hormone therapy and it worked and the pregnancy held. And so they just had to wait. The problem is nobody had had a Sumatran rhino pregnant before, so they weren't quite sure how long they had to wait. So <laughs> turns out how 16 long? months. <laughs> it takes 16 months to make a rhino baby. <laughs> and so 16 months later, Andalas was born. He was born in 2001. Um, three years later, they had a little girl named Suchi. And then three years after that, in 2007, Harapan was born. So eventually, um, Harry's uh, mom and dad passed away, and his sister died of um, a disease called iron storage disease, which is a significant um, issue for rhinos. But Andalas, um, Harapan's older brother, went back to the SRS in 2007, and he is now the father of two calves there, um, Andatu and Delilah. Um, you saw Delilah doing some photo bombs um, in, <laughs> in the background there in the videos. And then um, in 2015, the very difficult decision was made to move Harapan back to Indonesia. And this was moving the last Sumatran rhino out of the United States. But he um, moved to Indonesia. It was a 53-hour journey for him. Um, they rented out an entire ferry because they, they didn't want to put him on a short flight, and they, so they drove the truck into the ferry. He had the whole truck by himself because they didn't want to give him exhaust fumes or anything like that and drove him through the middle of the night into the SRS and he is a happy camper there. He's, um, he's put on weight. He's um, loving being in his natural environment and um, we are currently um, working on getting a hairy baby but it hasn't happened yet. So um, he's practicing with some of the females there. And, <laughs> um, so if everybody can wish Harry good luck, we need it. <laughs> And so hopefully we'll have some more rhino babies soon. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds like the, all the lessons learned back in the 80s about the reproductive biology are now being applied to the current effort of making more Sumatran rhino babies. Absolutely, absolutely. Without the years of research and studying and husbandry and care of these animals, we wouldn't be able to succeed. Yeah, that's great. Good story. Um, Kira, I'm thinking that um, we might have some folks in the crowd that are perhaps skeptical of, of the approach and, and wonder, you know, there's so few of them. Is this a last, a last ditch effort um, to save this species? So first of all, how would you respond to them? And then if you would also put it in the broader context of other captive propagation efforts to, to save endangered species. Sure. Uh, Catherine, what I would say to them is that the state of the species that we share this planet with are, is in crisis. I, we've heard from the UN report a few weeks ago that there are a million species slipping towards extinction. And so we are seeing this situation with more and more species. And the, but the good news is that we know that it works. Um, so there are a number of species now that have been brought back from very small numbers. For example, the Mauritian kestrel. Back in 1970, there were just four birds left four birds, two breeding pairs. But thanks to the dedicated, coordinated efforts of a team of people, um, they were able to breed those birds and get them back, and now there are 300 flying around Mauritius. 
The scimitar horned oryx similarly was declared extinct in the wild by IUCN in 2000. Thanks to a really coordinated effort by the governments, by teams of zoos all around the world, and by global expert communities, they've been reintroducing scimitar horned oryx now back into Chad, and there are now 100 individuals, and they're on track to reach a goal of 500 back in the wild in the next few years. Okay. So we know that this happens. There's a longer, longer list of black-footed ferrets, American bison, Californian condor, Many of them are stories that we know. Um, but the trick is really working together as one team. And all of us, all of us fighting to save species from extinction around the world, the end game, the point of success, is having healthy populations back in the wild, in thriving habitats with functioning ecosystems. But there are many different tools that we need to use and many different types of expertise to get us there. And often when we just work with one organisation or with our core community, the, we tend to use the techniques we're most familiar with or the ones that, that, um, that we're strongest in. And so what we really need is these collaborations that bring different expertise together. And um, sometimes that's habitat protection, sometimes it's anti-poaching patrols, sometimes it's bringing them into, into human care. Often it's a combination of all of those. And what we, what we do see quite often is a hesitation to bring animals into human care as though it's some implication that we've failed at protecting them in the wild. But we've just heard from Cece that this is a science. It takes a long time and lots of really, really dedicated expertise to figure out how to capture an animal, how to keep it alive, how to care for it, how to breed it, how it, how it performs reproductively. Um, and there's lots of nuance into that. And we need, we need time. We need time and experts working together to figure out those solutions. And we have recently seen some devastating consequences of what happens when we leave it too late. There was an example just uh, two years ago now, a little melamese, a little rodent off of, um, the, uh, off, on an island off the coast of northeast Australia. Um, the island was going underwater because of ri rising sea levels. And they knew this. And the habitat for this mouse was shrinking. And the scientific community and the government community of Australia debated what to do about this for five years. They finally decided to bring some into, into human care. It took six months to approve the permits, and a few weeks before the expedition to go and capture some of these, some of these mice, a huge storm surge came, washed the island underwater, and we've lost that, we've lost that species. And similarly, um, the vaquita porpoise is a very small porpoise in the Gulf of California. Many of you will know that really harrowing story. We waited until there were 30 individuals left, and we didn't know a thing about how to capture them, how to keep them alive, how to breed them. And despite really valiant, incredible efforts from a global team, that effort is not currently succeeding. And we, that, the future of that, of that porpoise is really in, in strife as well. So the secret here is that we know it can work. It really does. We just need to work together as a collaboration. And we need to start early. We can't wait until it's the 11th hour. Yeah, that sense of urgency is it's really pressing. Thank yeah. you. Um, OK, so Colby, what is the state of the Sumatran rhino rescue effort? Um, where are you all right now in the project, and, and what does it look like for the next five years of this partnership? Yeah, so um, right now in the three areas in Indonesia where we know there are rhinos in the wild, we're doing surveys to figure out where exactly the best place is to dig the pit traps to rescue them and bring them into the sanctuaries. This conversation wouldn't be complete if we didn't acknowledge Pahu, who is the rhino on the screen here. Um, Pahu is our first official rescue for the project. Um, back in November, um, she was living in a mining concession area in the Kalimantan region of of Indonesia and um, we so we uh, rescued her from there and now she has been relocated to a sanctuary in that same region and she is happy and healthy and you can tell she's happy because she's wallowing in the mud here and that means she's doing just great um, so really our goal is that we'll bring in more rhinos we'll start to really understand exactly where they are we'll bring more in and as Kira mentioned the end goal is not to have Pahu and a bunch of rhinos in, in a sanctuary forever. The goal is eventually to release them back into their natural ecosystem. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Cool. The other thing is we're not yeah. giving up on the protection. We're continuing to Good. protect the natural forests. And mm -hmm. we have partners, um, including the um, WWF and Rhino Foundation of Indonesia and Rudy Putra's organization, the fellow that you just talked about. They're out there day after day, 24 seven in the forests deactivating snares, ensuring that rhinos are safe. And they're not just protecting rhinos, they're protecting elephants, they're protecting tigers, they're protecting uh, scores of primates and birds and amphibians. And so these, these men and women are, are out 24 seven and we're ensuring that 
the, their habitat remains safe so that, so that when we do increase the population, we will have a place to release them to. Definitely. It, it really, truly is a proactive one plan approach. I mean, we're working with, with collaborative partners all over using decades of science and expertise and really making sure that we're setting the Sumatran rhino up to succeed in the long term. I think that's what's different about this project. And I really think that we're, that we're setting up kind of a dream team for Sumatran rhinos and all working from the same playbook to ensure that this project is different and we do bring the Sumatran rhino back from the brink. What a wonderful note to end on, that conservation can be done in a, in a different way, um, in a united, coordinated way with government, with implementing partners, with the conservation community fully united um, on this. So thank you. I know that um, people in the audience are probably thinking, how can I help? Um, well, <laughs> what you can do is tell your friends about this small, singing, hairy rhino. And then visit our website here, SumatranRhinoRescue.org, um, to find out other ways that you can get involved. And I want to thank Rudy Putra remotely and our wonderful panel here and all of you for um, listening. Thanks. Thank you.